My name is Nat Sodi, and this is From the Margins, where I talk to interesting people doing interesting things, and ask them to tell me their learning stories. In this episode, I talk to Chicago-based artist and educator Miguel Aguilar, aka Kane One. Miguel works at the intersection of graffiti, studio painting, art education, and community organizing. I mean, let's start from the beginning. Let's just um, tell me, you know, where where you're from, where you grew up, just a little bit about your your background. Sure. Uh, I'm from Pilsen. I've lived in the same building my whole life, uh, and so I went to grammar school here. Uh, where Where in Pilsen? I'm right by 18th and Racine. Oh, okay. So. Oh, I used to live at uh, 18th and Allport, basically. Oh, yeah, we're like, black away. Yeah. <laughs> you, so you still, you still live there? I'm still there. My grandparents bought the building in 1958, and so we've been there ever since. The way I got into uh, graffiti was through dancing. Um, I started, well, I didn't start. I be, was like one of the younger members of a dance group that um, other kids in the neighborhood had started. And so at and that how old time, were you? I was about 12. Just for reference for people, is this uh, like the 80s, 90s? What, what, late, what 80s. late 80s. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so there were, there were venues that would open up early for all ages, uh, hours. So um, kids could go to adult nightclubs from about 6 or 7 to 10 when curfew was up. So we started choreographing our own dance routines. Um, I, I bought turntables and I started making our own mixtapes. And then we would go and perform at these different venues throughout the city. <laughs> did, you know, uh, did you guys have an, uh, a name uh, group? Name for you? The group was called Posse in Effect. <laughs> uh, and the, the phrase was taken right out of a public enemy song. Nice. Uh, <laughs> and so uh, we were going from place to place many times on uh, public transportation. And so I, I started tagging PIE everywhere that we were going. We were all starting to tag just the name of our, our dance crew everywhere. Um, then I graduated grammar school and went to St. Ignatius. And that's where I met a bunch of Lincoln Park kids who already knew this whole graffiti scene and movement. And they were the ones that in homeroom were telling me, well, you're kind of doing it, but you don't know that this is really how it works. And um, all of this has already happened before um, us. And now we're in this conversation here, and so you have to get good at this. You have to get your name up as many places. And so they were kind of giving me the rundown on, on how the game works. So you're in high school, and you're just getting started, but these kids are already like... They, like, they were in the know. They, they were, were like the, wow. the expert gamers already. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any idea where they kind of, how they yeah, were well, able to get to where they, you know, in such a short time? Um, I figured out that um, we were freshmen and sophomores, and they were hanging around with their older brothers who were seniors or freshmen in college. And those were like the, the deep hip hop heads that were putting us onto X Clan and De La Soul and all of that stuff. So the, all of that was a body of knowledge that they were like handing down. Did you, how much attention did you, had you pay, paid atten- to it before? My entry point was, was pretty muddy. Um, in sixth grade, I started doing a lot of doodling uh, in, in school. Nobody understood or, or kind of really talked about why, but we all started trying to draw the same sort of icons and old English lettering. And some of it was just like, uh, just kind of practicing drawing. And so really um, basic visual tricks like that that stick S that everybody knows how to make out of six, le- six lines, or um, the, the optic cube that you don't know which way is in and out, like those sorts of things. But in addition to that, there's real like local cultural stuff. Like um, a lot of the people I went to grammar school with had older family members that were in gangs throughout our neighborhoods. And so what's something that was really important was to learn how to do old English by freehand. And so we started getting our hands on calligraphy pens, um, just practicing our, our, our regular names um, because it was a, sort of like this valuable asset in, in school to be able to do something like that really well. Really? Yeah. Like, like you actually, it was like a type of currency or like a, yeah. something that you could actually 
just to like, oh, you could do that, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> it was like this whole thing because if you could draw, you could make the flyer to the party. And if you could uh, DJ, you could play at the party. Or if you could dance, you would perform at the party. So it was kind of all of this, like anything that had something to do with gathering um, in, in space without rules. Like, Great parties happen in, in basement churches in Pilsen. Uh, and, and just doing, being able to do all those things was just your way of, of being able to part, like basically. Yeah, it was being a, be a uh, part of it, you know. Being social yeah. um, in a way that was uh, enjoyable and didn't have so many consequences or stakes. Because the other ways that I was seeing community was through uh, gang territory. Uh, it was a lot of gang lines that I had to cross just to get back and forth on foot um, from my house to grammar school. And it wasn't irregular to hear ricocheting gunshots at like 3.15 in the afternoon during the weekdays. So it was something that I knew I wanted to avoid, which is why finding out all these other cultural outlets was so attractive. And I would imagine to, to a certain degree, people would either A, leave you alone and not, not Right. Not mess with you, or B, they might actually like, hey, that shit's dope. I really like, like what you do. There's definitely that whole uh, part of gang community that if they see somebody interested in, in the arts on their own, that they make it a note to like, oh, don't mess with that kid. Like, he's trying to figure something out for himself. Or, um, you know, can, can you draw something for my brother or something like that, those kinds of requests. And um, it was never like, oh, this guy's good at drawing, we better recruit him into our gang. It was, <laughs> right. it was the opposite, like kind of protecting to, to see the potential in somebody else. How are you, you sort of just kind of constantly either get working at it, uh, getting better at it? Like what, what's, what's, what was, what's that, what's the learning process like when you're, when you're... I remember being scared and, um, having to go steal paint because I wasn't 18 and I couldn't buy it all over the counter and I couldn't ask anybody to, to buy it for me because it was the same thing as like asking somebody to buy a, a bottle of liquor from the liquor store for you. So I, I, I don't imagine, you know, they're like necessarily like you couldn't go onto the web or buy books or... You know, What's that like? Yeah. You, so you're basically just kind of like figuring it out for yourself and just learning purely just from... Yeah. The, the, Sort of three resources that were available um, were the graffiti in my neighborhood that I would see. Um, and so those became a reference. Like people like Zor and Ice Pack and London and Anti, these people that are about 10 to 15 years older than me, they were already painting in the neighborhood and had already been doing it since before I even thought of doing it. And then there actually were uh, two books. Uh, spray can art and, and subway art. Um, they were two photo books, uh, all New York scene. And then I learned about Style Wars, the documentary that came out in 1983. Um, other than that, there, it was really like, what are you going to do? Like, this is as much that has been done. So what are you going to do that's different and innovative? Or how are you going to stand out in this body of work? Um, so moving from drawing a lot on paper, there was really no other next step uh, besides going and finding some secluded place to try it out illegally. Uh, there was no safe space, there was no classroom, definitely wasn't being taught in any after school programming. So I would, I would draw in pen and paper at school and then get my hands on a couple of cans. You wouldn't need a lot of spray paint just to figure out how to tag. A tag could go on a, a light pole or a corner of a building or an underpass or a viaduct. And those are not a lot of, you don't consume a lot of time doing those. So that's sort of one quick way of, of getting your, your first taste at, at, at the medium and the process. And was, were, your, were your parents were, were you aware at all that you were doing any <laughs> that you were doing? I mean, not I, those first couple of years, yeah. but by the time that I was like really owning it, um, 
I was letting my parents and my family know, like if we would be on the way to the doctor's office or something, and I was like, look, I just painted that last night off the expressway or weird stuff like that, then um, they would kind of laugh it off. Like, you right. better not get in trouble. I don't want to <laughs> get you out of jail or right. don't wake me up when you're in jail. <laughs> those kinds of jokes. But um, it, those were like really tremendously scary situations that I had to put myself in in order to try out spray painting. So it wasn't just like, oh, let me pick up this can and learn how to do it. It was like, let me learn how to trespass for the first time. Let me learn like, how to not get caught by Amtrak security or the police officers. Let me make sure that the uh, property owners don't have any security systems, like all of these things simultaneously. You know, most art students, you know, you're just learning how to just do your, your craft, yeah. you know. Um, but you're having to not only, you're figuring out how to paint, you're figuring out how to work with your medium, <laughs> but you've got to figure, I mean, you've got to learn all this, this other stuff just to be able to even just do your art. And, you know, it's just yeah. like... Yeah, it, it, it was really hard to learn how to deal with adrenaline. I remember one of the first times that I ventured out on my own to, to spray paint something larger was at about 4.30 in the afternoon, and it was on the storage warehouse right at 16th and Canal. And I was really scared. I, I mean, I couldn't stay out late at dark. Um, I was still 15, and so I had to be home at a certain time. And um, so I rode my bike uh, alone. Uh, this is all like you're just kind of going through this by yourself. It sounds like a pretty solo <laughs> kind of, you know, learning that's going on here. Yeah, it, well, the thing about painting, growing up and painting here in Pilsen that was different from my counterparts that were growing up in Lincoln Park is that um, they had their whole sort of group of kids that they could continue hanging out with for the rest of the afternoon into the evening. Um, and I didn't have that like growing up down here. But I started meeting graffiti writers sort of in the early 90s in, in Pilsen that I had no other history with. So it, it was um, kids that went to different grammar schools, that went to different high schools, that lived in different sections of Pilsen, sort of like these sub neighborhoods. Um, and it was like the first time that I met them through only graffiti. How, and how does that happen? Um, you start tagging around the same times, you start tagging around the same areas, you're gonna eventually like, uh, see some other creepy person walking to and from a space, <laughs> and, or you know, so you kind of like give that that weird nod, like yeah, yeah, maybe yeah. you're that person, or maybe I'm this person, and then, or you see somebody walking with a, a sketchbook, and then that's the automatic sort of bookmark, like oh, that person's a tagger. If you're like learning art in school, you have the classroom structure, you got the teacher, you know. What, where did that happen for you in, in the graffiti world, that sort of, you know, being able to bounce ideas off other people, get, get, get critique or, you know? Yeah. So I started to figure out who the, the better graffiti writers were, who were the ones that were doing, like, the jaw-dropping graffiti installations, and then what were sort of their, their sites, what, what were their practice habits? Like if there was a, a permission wall on 18th and Miller that Zor would paint, how often would that turn over? And what are the chances that I can get to see him turning that over into a new installation? Um, so I, you know, that's one example of how I, I learned about all the other permission walls throughout Pilsen and Little Village. And so there is this uh, ecology, right? Like I'll let you paint, can I paint next to you? And while I'm painting next to you, um, maybe I could watch and learn something. And that's really how the, the knowledge of, uh, of graffiti happened for me, um, painting with people who were only like two or three years older than me, but just felt like these elders, these generations yeah. of elders at that point. And then the other thing was getting into the better crews, right? So graffiti writers operate in collectives, and it's, you start to identify like, which are the better crews to be, to be in, almost like trying to get drafted by the right basketball teams, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so what does it mean to be in a crew when it comes to graffiti? Like, you... um, there's, there's different, 
aspirations, there's different intentions. Yeah. There, there are graffiti crews that want to do illegal tagging the most out of everything. Right? There are crews that want to paint CTA train the most out of everything else. Um, and then there's like crews that want to paint only permission walls and do only commission work or work with permission um, the best. Um, but oh, in the age that I was growing up in, you kind of wanted to be well-rounded in all of those areas um, because that was like this overall consensus of being a capable graffiti writer. Right, right, right. I, yeah, I gotta imagine, like if you had to like kind of, what do you call it when you kind of break down an athlete's like different skills or whatever like if graffiti is it like it's some combination of your artistic ability yeah. your uh you know you're trying to learn how to do this like what are the different areas that you've got to learn how to be good at so, you know? so if you can do a really good tag that's something that you can put up everywhere if you can do a really good throw up that is something that has a high impact in a high traffic area that only takes a, a half a minute or a minute at most uh, and then you start doing like your, your readable letters, like how that starts getting into how well you can emulate sort of sign painting aesthetics. Uh, and then your, your wild styles, like how intricate and complex can you get into your lettering. You know, in your mind, like who's like a hall of famer in the graffiti world and why are they like, what makes them a hall of famer? You know? um, if somebody could do a really complex well executed graffiti piece that is done illegally on a CTA train. That is like the pinnacle <laughs> of being, you're going down in history at that right, point, right, right? right? Like that person had to do enough research to know how to get into the train yard <laughs> undetected, uh, know how to take in all of the needed materials because in order to paint like a whole car, you have to take your own ladder into a train. Um, so the, all of these sort of things that like, yep, that person did a lot of work to get that done. <laughs> and they put, and they were able to put up an awesome. Right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know, did you, have you ever, have you ever, have you ever done that, <laughs> that yourself? <laughs> I'm not gonna say I have. <laughs> um, and I'm not gonna tell on people who have done it either. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. Uh, so, Let's fast forward a little bit just to kind of like a college age, mm -hmm. you know, was there, was there a moment where you start thinking like, where is this going? Or, you know, as you get older and start thinking about adult things, you know? Yeah. Um, it really had to do with me taking my, uh, my first two art history surveys at SAIC. That then so even like the decision of going to art school, at that point you were like, I want to do art in some way, shape or form, and I'm going to go to art school. Like, was that kind of a... What was that? Yeah, when I would think about art, like larger art, it felt way more intimidating because I had to stand out against thousands of years of history. Mm, mm. Um, whereas what I was doing here uh, as a kid outside, I knew all the history. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. So it was so brand new that I could still make a dent. But when I went to SIC, I was like, oh, this is the hard stuff that like the books in, in my high school art classes were talking about. We're doing a lot of rigorous stuff and it's all sort of this avant-garde stuff that we're not learning in a school. It's, it's a school of thought that's operating on its own. Um, I couldn't talk about graffiti in my painting class or any of my studio practices. I couldn't talk about graffiti in art history. I couldn't talk about it in any of the other content areas that I was learning because the, the perception, the, uh, the feedback that I was getting from any of those professors was like, well, that's just a fad. That's just like some kid stuff. Um, that, that 80s stuff has been done and over with. There's no going back to it. Like it's had its moments in the galleries when it was exploited in 85 and it's disposable. It's not important. Like what we're trying to teach you has way more cachet, um, is way more significant. And so when I got that, um, that feedback, 
I knew I had to keep my mouth shut. So were you doing a totally different type of art at school? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or was somehow your graffiti, or were you trying to kind of work, somehow work your graffiti well, the only, into your, into your quote unquote, you know, straight art, if, you, if that's what you yeah. want to call it? <laughs> there, was, um, there was none of that that was being accepted into my studio courses. I couldn't infuse graffiti with something else. What was kind of being shoved down my throat was, um, well, you're like the only Hispanic kid in my class. You should go look at the codices, or why don't you make Aztec work? Or oh, like all of the cliche, <laughs> like, <laughs> most horrible things you could think of. Um, uh, and see we want some... to see more of you yeah. in, in, your, in your artwork. Yeah. <laughs> so I was like, oh my god, that is such a boring thing to consider doing. But you know, where as it seems like. Previously, like all of your sort of more f most formative stuff has been almost stuff that's happened outside of school. Mm -hmm. Is it was it SAIC or um, or was it something that happened outside of school? school? It was um, it was two professors in particular. One was in Viscom. His name was John Piscina, and uh, another professor who still teaches there, George Lieber, in the painting department. And what I got out of both of those professors. Um, John Piscina taught me Bauhaus aesthetics, and um, that really informed my thinking in graffiti, compositions outdoors, uh, mural layouts, invisible grids, uh, how, how those concepts could inform my, my lettering structures. So that was really impactful. The, what George Lieber taught me in critiques was that whether I know it or not, my art is going to be placed in a larger conversation of art. And the more I know about the larger conversation of art, the more impactful and significant my particular art can be. What's that thing, that, that final point on this, on this pathway to get to you know, where you are now? Um, um, what, would that, what would that be? Yeah, there was a, a particular day that my crew and I were painting on Blue Island and Western, and we were just painting a new production, um, going about our business. And a mother came up to me out of uh, nowhere and started asking me questions in Spanish. And she asked what high school I learned graffiti in, um, or which college I learned graffiti in, or um, sort of which community center teaches graffiti. Because she had a, a boy at home who, uh, she didn't want him to have to go and learn graffiti illegally. And I was like, I, we had to learn this on our own. Like, there was no high school, there was no college. I went to college, but I didn't learn graffiti in college. Um, and that didn't turn me into an art educator overnight. But that was the one thing, the one interaction with somebody randomly that sparked this entire thing of like, there's a void and there's, there's this new need. And um, that wasn't part of the conversation when I was a kid, but if I can help address that now, like, I would love to dive all the way into that. The, the Graffiti Institute, is that still, is that, is that, you started that in 2012, and is that, that's still going on? Yep. And can you just give me a little bit of background on what the Graffiti Institute is? Sure. Yeah. So, uh, Graffiti Institute is my art ed initiative. It's a project, basically, that's turning into a full program and institution. I decided to start thinking about ideal programming that would be aligned with how graffiti operates on its own. As I kind of hear your, your story and then kind of culminating here, you know, because the art form is so rooted in, 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 in that process of kind of learning it on your own, the, even the sort of the illegal side of it, how do you feel about that, that sort of change into something that's, that's you know, it, you're, you're creating like an actual type of education around it and it's more quote unquote accepted? So Graffiti Institute as a education space, um, what we're working against are these normatives of uh, art ed. And uh, the way we're thinking about our programming is much more aligned with how our experience as graffiti painters came to be, right? So we don't want to have 
20 or 30 students. Um, we want to have five students. So um, for me, a 10-week graffiti class doesn't do anything. Yeah. I'm much more interested in um, identifying five people that I can spend the next three years with. Right? What is that as a model? Um, and what are the things that are necessary for that to, to, for me to facilitate that? So can you take me a little bit through the process of, sure. you, know, um, you know, what you might, like what a student might go through in the, at the Graffiti Institute? Yeah. Um, so our fundamental scaffold for how we think about curriculum is um, identity, self-affirmation, which is uh, where we begin with somebody picking a name um, and using that name until they feel comfortable with it or they, they choose to go through a series of names. But it's a process of, um, it gives people a chance to start their own identity or their, their own sense of self uh, from scratch. Uh, because of the anonymity around graffiti and because of um, the work having to really stand on its own, um, that for communities that are in socioeconomic crisis, um, that don't have a lot of cathartic outlets, um, it, it holds a lot of value and potential for, for people going through hard times. The way school is kind of structured, identity is not even really a part of it. You know, you're there to learn math, right. English, and so it's like you, right. you could be any, like you're like um, this sort of generic human being that that learns math that learns english yeah. that learns and it's you're not even dealing with that aspect of what you're trying to figure out in your own life at that time i guess is what right. i'm hearing you say yeah Just, yeah i it's the in the stages of of development it's just this natural progression right you're you're moving out of latent age of trying to figure out uh where you fit between your fantasy imagination and the consequences of reality. And then you're coming into these tweens and teenage years of, um, and it, it poses this, this new threshold of identity crisis. Um, so there are all these new options um, that your parents get much more serious about um, what they hope you grow up to be. And then you have all of these um, sort of tropes of roles, right? Like, do you have to become a jock? Do you have to uh, become a musician? There are all these uh, high school culture expectations, um, which can be really overwhelming and leave somebody feeling like they're, they're in an abyss of identity. That's when it becomes potentially significant. Like, oh, if I come up with a, a, a name that doesn't have any of my own personal baggage, um, that uh, if I'm gonna do this anonymously, and if I put my name on a sticker, and the only way that somebody knows me is because of this sticker that I just put on the pole, then I can reinvent myself um, as a way that I would like to be portrayed as. Or I can uh, reinvent myself in a way that puts me in a uh, better disposition than my, my real life is. So is there things that you, in terms of how you teach at the Graffiti Institute, in your mind that you wish you would see more in school or that you wish your kids had? Um, we're gonna be honest about uh, technical capacity and we're gonna be honest about um, sort of uh, ambition, ambitious goals. I feel like there's a lot of enabling um, good intentions that um, almost defeat the purpose of, of uh, offering programming to teens because uh, they don't want to, they're afraid to ask them to, to rise to the challenge, right? So um, the sooner I can stop lying to teenagers who are possibly thinking, well, graffiti might be a career move. Like that's something new, but it's, it's something new that's coming from the perception of the youth that I've been engaged with over the last 10 years, I've been hearing that. Like, oh, if I grow up to graffiti, I can um, get a shoe deal, or I can um, become this uh, world famous graphic designer, because they see graffiti aesthetics on television commercials, or in animated movies, or on clothing lines. And 
they know that that started at the root with somebody just spray painting. Great. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, this has been a really awesome conversation. Uh, really thank, like thank you for sitting down with me and talking to me. Sure. Thank you.